Hey everyone, it's Nick. Welcome back to another duality repair video. In front of me tonight I have a Line 6 LD150. It's a 150 watt bass guitar amplifier. Very neat. So the gentleman who dropped this off said that the symptom was low output. So low volume. And the nice thing about this unit is that you don't need a bass guitar to test it. So if you're someone like me, someone who does not have a bass guitar, you can simply plug in a 3.5 millimeter phone plug into the jack in the back and hook that up to your mp3 player, your computer, whatever you want. Put whatever music you want in there. So that's what I have right now. I actually have it hooked up to my computer and I have it hooked up to a 432 hertz tone. Uh, I thought it would be simple, easy to uh, easy to hear and distinguish between any other um, music or something like that if it's jumbled. So let's turn it on and see if we get an output and if we do, if it's low or what. I'm going to turn it on right now. Oh. So we did have a tone. I'm sure you could hear that. Uh, it was on for two, maybe two seconds and then it shut off. We have lights, so there's still power. Let me power cycle it again. Off. Same thing. Interesting. Um, so I believe when it's plugged in to the... Yeah, definitely. That's the case. When you have an MP3 input plugged in, the master volume is no longer in control. This is this is all the way down. The uh, Your source volume is what's controlling the volume. So I'm going to turn the volume down on the source very low. That's as low as it goes right there. I'm going to power cycle it, see if the volume changed there. Turning it back on. Did sound quieter. I'm going to turn the volume up now, see if it gets louder. Oh, yeah. So it's responding to volume commands, at least through the MP3 input. It does have input, but for some reason it, it's shutting down. Hmm. Maybe some sort of protection. It certainly sounds okay. Thought I'd show you how I was able to remove the control assembly. Uh, it's very simple. I'm very appreciative of the engineers at Line 6 for making this so easy to remove. Not all units are, um, are so easy to work on. So to get it out, you have six screws, one in each corner of the top of the cabinet, and then one on either side of the handle pull the handle off, you pull all six screws out, and then you slide it out from the front. So push it from the back, slide it out. You want to slide it out maybe three to four inches, and then you have to disconnect the cable to the speaker here on the left, and then carefully slide it out. The only thing that's going to run into is that speaker wire, so kind of keep that speaker wire flat on the bottom so that you don't uh, drag anything over it and try and, and cut it. And then the whole thing just slides out. I'd also be careful, you can see how this bottom is exposed. When you're pulling it out, try not to, to reach your fingers too deep into the bottom where you might touch uh, something um, with uh, some voltage on it, like a capacitor. Most things are um, not really exposed. You do have some potentiometers, so I'm not sure what kind of voltages are on there. Just uh, be cautious. And then you just slide the uh, power cord out through the front, and then you're out. That's it. So there's the speaker cable there. That's the only thing that really can trip you up. So there's even a note on the top. Very nice of them. You can see it there. It says stop here. The line all the way across. So it prevents you from pulling this uh, control assembly all the way out and then potentially ripping the cord to the speaker. Pretty simple. Now we can take a look at this entire module. See if we find anything. Here's the control assembly removed from the cabinet. Uh, it's upside down and forward facing, so I have the control in the front here with all of the knobs. Main input power coming in from the back. So I guess we'll walk through this pretty quickly. Mains power comes into this power board here. 
uh, via this connector and this connector. Goes through a fuse, a couple of capacitors, where it comes back out through this connector to the transformer, presumably step down, and then comes back to the power board through this connector. It's then rectified with a full wave bridge rectifier here in the back. Goes through a bunch of filtering capacitors here, the main filter caps, your output filter caps, before it's outputted to the front uh, board via these blue cables and then the audio output board via the white cables. Uh, audio input. So we have two on the front, a passive and active input, so that's where you're going to plug your guitar into. For me, I'm plugging it into the back here. I'm not going to flip it around because it is uh, plugged in. It's not powered on, but it's plugged in. The MP3 input is on this top board here, and that audio signal comes to the front board via one of these gray cables, one of these smaller gray cables, passes through the front board, um, passes through the blue cables to the power board, and then finally passes into the audio output board before passing out to the speaker via this connector here, which obviously is disconnected. Um, first things first is a visual inspection. Sometimes you get lucky and an issue becomes apparent after just a visual inspection. You hardly need to use any sort of meter to, to uh, find the problem. Uh, I've done a little bit of an inspection already. Power board, fuse is okay. I don't see any signs of burning or overheating. All of the capacitors look to be in good order. They're not raised, no leakage coming out of their vent tops. The audio output board, all of those capacitors look to be in good order as well. Not raised, no leakage out of the bottom or top out of the vent. And then the front board, I didn't si see any signs of overheating and those capacitors look to be in good order as well. So passes the visual inspection, I'll go on to checking voltages next. Um, I don't have a schematic or a service manual, but these boards seem to have the voltages printed on them pretty well. So I should be able to determine what the voltages should be and where. So let's start with the mains input. I know I have uh, power getting to the front board because the lights turn on and we do get an audio output for a second or two. So I'm just going to check power through the whole unit here. So I'll power it on. I'm in AC. Excuse me. Now I'm in AC. There's a ground pin over here on the left that I'll use for my main ground. Slide this over so you can see a little bit better. We'll just follow the power through the unit a little bit. So I'll start at the fuse. I know I'm going to have 120 approximately volts there of AC. Yes, I do, 121. It's going to make it through the fuse, obviously. The fuse is okay. That's going to come out, again, out of this connector to my transformer. So we can check there, 120 volts there, to the transformer transformer is going to drop the voltage down and come here. Uh, of course I can't use the ground pin as a reference anymore. So this one's got several windings on it. Not sure what the voltages are going to be. So we have 70 coming from pin 1 to pin 2, 26 coming from 1 to 3, and 35 and a half from 1 to 4. So. There's no labels on that connector. I'm going to assume this transformer is in good order. It looks to be in really good order. Uh, for a transformer to be faulty is very rare. So I'm going to assume that this is working properly. So again, all of these voltages will be rectified through the rectifier and filtered through all these capacitors where they'll come into this board and this board. So there are voltage labels on this right next to this connector here as well as this connector. So I'm going to check here. This seems to be an easier point to check. So I'm going to go to DC since it is rectified. I'm going to start in the 200 volt DC range. And sorry about that. You can't see, but I'm going to tell you how these are labeled. So I'm going to call this pin on the right here pin 1. Try and stop that movement there. It's tough. This pin on the right here is pin 1, 
and it's an 8 pin connector so the pin on the left I'm going to call pin 8. Again that's just what I'm calling it. So pin 1 is labeled VS, positive VS, so V supply. Pin 2 is labeled ground, pin 3 is labeled minus VS, pin 4 is mute, pin 5 is minus 16, looks like a V but I think it's U so that might be for the a uh, controller drive. Then you have audio ground, it's pin 6, audio po uh, positive, it's pin 7, and audio minus is pin 8. So I'm not going to worry about pin 6, 7, or 8 because I don't have any audio in there. I'm not going to, I don't want any audio hooked up right now without a speaker hooked up. So I'm going to start with pin 1 and pin 3. That's supposed to be pin 1 should be plus VS. So we'll see what that comes out as. I want my black probe on my ground pin just for polarity reasons. VS is tough to get a good connection there. About 50 volts DC. That should make V minus minus 50 volts if I can get a good connection on there. Yep. Okay. So again, of course they're not labeled with the voltage just positive VS minus VS. So those seem like reasonable voltages for me and they are equal. One thing I just noticed, this thing has a fan back here to cool uh, this heat sink which is uh, attached to these looks like driver driver chips here and the fans not on and if I spin it it does spin freely so I doubt the fans bad I would think that this thing should be on no matter what unless it's uh, temperature regulated which is possible it's possible but I would bet that that fan needs to be on so it looks like it's got a little connector here it's tough tough for you to see on the camera, but I'm going to check um, output to that fan because I'm curious. I'm not getting voltage to the fan. Where else am I not getting it? That's not going to be in the 200 volt range. Let me take a look here. I can actually see a label on the uh, board that says 12 volts fan. So on one of these two pins, between ground and that pin should be 12 volts DC. So let's see. This is the red pin. Minus 13 volts. Interesting. And blue pin. Minus 15 volts. That doesn't seem right. Interesting. So right away I'm suspecting a possible voltage issue. Another thing I'm curious about, um, when I power it on and it and the audio outputs for a second or two and then kicks out, I was thinking maybe some sort of protection um, kicking in. And so why you would need that would potentially be voltage, keep bumping the camera, DC voltage on the speaker. So if I look at the speaker connector, I know you can't see it. It looks like it's going to be these two pins right here. So this first pin and the second pin. Those are my outputs to my speaker. So I'm just going to see if there's any sort of voltage on those two pins. So I'm going to check pin 1 to pin 2. Huh. There looked to be a bit of voltage on there. It is dropping, so it's not a constant output, but that's interesting. So there was maybe 15 volts on there, DC. I'm going to power it off. Obviously, there should be nothing there now. See, there's still residual DC voltage. Let me power it back on. Wow. That maxed the 20, 
20 volt range for a second. It does drop, but I'm going to turn it on and then turn it off and then see if there's voltage there. Yeah. There's 20 volts DC on the speaker output. Just from powering it on and then even powering it off, it's it remains. That might be our issue. Alright, after a little bit of checking, I'm no longer concerned with DC voltage on the output. And I'll show you what I mean. So right now I have the speaker hooked up. I have my oscilloscope probe hooked up to the output to the speaker. And I have a sine wave coming into the unit. So I'm going to power the unit on. You can see the where the unit at, is at right now, the voltage, when it's off. So you'll see in here the sine wave as it comes on for a second or two. And then watch what happens to this line as I shut it off. So it doesn't move, right? And now I'll shut it off. So the unit's still on. If there's any DC voltage present, it'd be right there. And then when I turn it off, it would shift. I turned it off, there was no shift. So I'm not concerned about DC on the output. I'm actually not concerned with that audio output board at all anymore. I believe the problem is coming from the muting pin. Um, more specifically, the muting circuit. So I'll, I will cut back to the control assembly. I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, so I have the unit disconnected from the speaker as well as the audio input removed. And so I'm going to put my probe on the mute pin. And I have my meter in DC volts. Watch what happens when I turn it on. Spikes to 20 for about a second and then drops back down to zero. So this coincides exactly with um, the output. When that muting pin is high, as in, in this case, 20 volts, the output is enabled and you get sound. When it drops to zero, it's disabled. And so the muting pin um, is driven to this, uh, both of these amplifiers. I pulled up the data sheets on these. Their muting pins. Um, they will enable or disable the output of the amplifier. So how it works is if the muting pin voltage is greater than 1.5 volts, the output is enabled. If the muting pin voltage is less than 1.5 volts, the output is disabled. So that's why our output is being disabled. That voltage, that muting pin voltage is dropping below 1.5 volts. Specifically, it's going to zero volts. So that muting pin is goes through the white wires, goes across the power board, through the blue wires, and it is sourced from this main board. So for some reason, this main board is disabling that muting pin. It's dropping that voltage from 20 to 0, which is, disables our output. Thankfully, very, very thankfully, I was able to find a service manual online, which included schematics. So here's one of the schematics for the main board. And you'll see I have some of it highlighted here. This is the power fail detect circuit. And so you'll see I have the yellow and pink highlighted. Yellow is the amp mute um, current flow path in standard form, so when the output is enabled. And the pink is when the output is disabled or when the system is muted. So how this works, and it actually kind of tells you right here. So at Q1, which is this diode right here, it's actually an adjustable shunt regulator, Q1 turns off when 3.3 volts is less than 3.05 volts, plus or minus 1.4%. So this regulator has an input of 3.3 volts, goes across this resistor R34, and the uh, reference voltage right here is measured. And so if this input voltage is below nominal, this will not conduct. So what this does is normally when this conducts, you'll get this 16U voltage. It'll conduct through this transistor here, obviously through Q1, and then Q1 will conduct through Q2, and then Q2 will conduct through Q3, and then out here. So you'll get this 16U voltage, whatever that is, which in this case it seems to be around 20 volts, that will be what your amp mute voltage is. If this input voltage is too low or there's a problem with this 
initial part of the circuit, Q1 will not conduct, therefore Q2 will not conduct, therefore Q3 will not conduct, and your mute pin will be pulled to ground via R125, and that's what it says here. Q1 turns off, Q2 turns off, Q3 turns off, and R125 pulls the mute low. So, things to check. I wrote them down. Number one, I have to check incoming 3.3 voltage, and I'm going to check it at R34. I want to check it at the input of R34. And make sure it's 3.3. If it's too low, that's our issue. If that's not the issue, I'm going to check R34 itself. Make sure there's no problem there. Make sure it's not open. Make sure it's, um, as it's labeled, 4.75K. Next, I'm going to check R124. That's down here. So if this is off, that's going to affect our reference voltage, and that will affect the uh, working of Q1 as well. So I'm going to check that. I'm going to check C32. That's this over here. If this is shorted for some reason, that could definitely cause an issue. And then I'm going to check Q1 itself to make sure that's not shorted um, or have any other issues. So this is where I'm going to start is looking at this power fail detect circuit. It took me quite a long time to figure out where all of these components were on the board because they were on the back. So I had to remove the board and all of the components on this power fail detect circuit were on the back. So I tested the 3.3 volts coming in at R34 here and it was 3.29. So I know my input 3.3 volts was good. So this power fail circuit, um, unless there was an issue with one of the components, was not the reason why the system was muting. So I checked all of the components, I checked the resistor values, and I made sure they weren't shorted <clears throat> or open, and I checked all of the transistors to make sure they had the appropriate voltage drop and uh, they weren't shorted as well. All of those components checked out. So that's not the issue. I did find the issue. The issue was with the other part of the mute circuit. So again our mute is over here on the right and you'll see this one leg goes down to the power fail detect. The other leg comes up and comes over to the DSP digital signal processing chip. So if you look at pin 95 here you'll see a, a line coming out that's connected to the DSP mute. And if you're reading there, you're probably already reading ahead. That's okay. But um, the DSP chip itself can enable the mute or disable the audio output as well, as well as this power fail detect. So that's what's happening. I checked 3.3 volts, or excuse me, I checked for voltage at this resistor here, and it was getting 3.3 volts. What that's doing is it's turning on this transistor, which is allowing this positive 16U, which is actually 24 volts, to uh, flow through the transistor, which is pulling this pin to ground. So that's what's happening. The DSP, for some reason, is outputting the mute signal. It's outputting 3.3 volts to enable the mute or disable the audio. Now, <clears throat> I wasn't sure why the DSP would be doing that. Looked at the service manual, and the only thing I found was that the tuner, when you have the tuner enabled, which is just a button on the front, the volume button is muted during tuning. So. What I think hap is happening is either the DSP is corrupt in some way, or it's just thinking that the tune button or the tune circuit is enabled the whole time, which is obviously not the case. I verified the tune button is working, so I have the unit powered on. This is exactly what it looks like when it's powered up. I press the tuner button here, the tune LED illuminates and these two other buttons, these two other LEDs and this one uh, turn off. You can see this one over here too. So right now these are active. These signals are active, these channels. And when the tuner 
circuit is active, these are disabled. So this circuit seems to be working correctly. You can actually see the Smart FX disable as well. So I don't think that's the problem. I don't think tuner button is the problem. I think there's something wrong with that DSP chip. So what I did was I removed R120, which is right here. I taped it to the sheet here just so I don't lose it. And what that's doing is preventing the 3.3 volts from coming across this circuit and enabling this transistor, which is keeping my mute pin high instead of pulling it to ground. That's what should happen anyway, so I haven't tested it yet. I believe it's going to work. Normally I don't like doing workarounds like this. It's kind of like removing or disabling an interlock uh, on a piece of equipment. This is usually there for safety, either protect the user or the, the piece of equipment itself. In this case, I don't think there's any risk to the, uh, to the amp simply because all, all that this is going to do is going to prevent the output from muting when the tuner circuit's active. So this normally would mute the amp. I'll have to tell the owner that it's not going to do that. So just to disable the audio or you know turn the volume down when you have the tuner active. Everything else is going to work. It's doing nothing to this power fail detect circuit. It's not touching that. So if we have low incoming voltage, this power fail detect circuit is still going to work, it's still going to pull the mute low, and it's still going to um, drop the audio output. So I'm not too concerned with removing this resistor. I'm going to test this uh, for a considerable amount of time to make sure nothing's overheating and that it works properly. Uh, that, that is, of course, if it does work. I think it will. Let's check it out. So I have it on, obviously. I have audio hooked up, and I'm going to press play. We'll see if it works. It works. I'm very happy. I love it. <clears throat> so there we go. I'm going to turn that down. I I'll turn it up just to see if I can handle a uh, higher volume. to avoid any sort of copyright issue. So this thing is fixed. Um, it was a little bit of a workaround, but I don't think, you know, I think the only other option would be to replace or reprogram that DSP chip, and I don't have the capability of doing either of those. I don't have a DSP chip. I don't have the capability of reprogramming that one. Um, so I'm going to call this thing fixed. It's working. I'm going to test it, like I said, for a considerable amount of time. But it is working. So that's it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.